Shanna Dunlop, who's the curator of the Fanshawe Pioneer Village in London, and who actually started her career at the Brandt Museum and Archives. And so uh, I'll be very interested to go and see the new storage they have. <laughs> OK, there you go. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for being here today. I've been really inspired by all your stories and all the work that's, that's going to be ahead. And uh, Fanshawe Pioneer Village has recently, um, actually we're at the tail end of um, uh, a large relocation um, and processing project that has um, gone on for most part of a decade. So I, I do know what it's like to be on the other end and the day that you um, find everything you're looking for on the first try is just amazing. So it is it is so worth it. And you will find yourself from time to time just wandering up to your storage area and standing there and looking around because it, it's, it's an amazing experience. Okay, so um, bear with me. I know it's the end of a, a long but very exciting day. Um, but we do want to talk about deaccessioning, what Simon had asked I come and uh, specifically speak on. Um, a very important part in, in any collections reorganization project. Now, I'm, I'm not proposing deaccessioning is uh, your solution to this problem by any means, or that is even a strategy. Um, rather, uh, deaccessioning, when um, done in accordance with professional standards and uh, with a conscien conscious uh, um, uh, ethics, um, uh, conscious eye to ethics, it's a key component of any responsible collection stewardship program. Uh, so just to start off, um, FPV, Fanshawe Pioneer Village in London, we are a 45 acre open air museum. I'm sorry, I should have brought a picture. Um, we have a complex of 28 heritage and replica buildings. Um, we also have a working farm with a heritage breeds program. Um, we do, um, all of our education is interactive. We're highly interactive, um, focused on, on, on demonstrations and engagement. I was hired 13 years ago, um, technically to, to move the collection to a new facility. So what have I been doing for 13 years, uh, might you ask, when Peterborough did it in, wow, three weeks there. But uh, <laughs> there was a few other layers involved. Um, number one, the new building wasn't there yet, nor was the funding. So the, you know, there's a, a good deal of time. Um, there was also the minor blip of our entire organization almost um, closing and shutting its doors. Um, some of you might remember that in, in the community. Um, but uh, that's a whole other story, not why I'm here today. Um, we're going to talk today about um, deaccessioning. So what I want to do today is um, give you a little bit of context of Fanshawe Pioneer Village um, and our situation. I think deaccessioning, it's very important to remember that it's very, very specific to your situa situation and especially your collecting history. Um, the big thing I want to focus on is, is the lessons I've, I've learned and to share those with you, both the benefits and challenges and as best as I can give some advice on tips and best practices. Uh, I'm not going to discuss our move or um, uh, storage design because that's a whole other story and we've uh, heard much more inspirational examples today. Okay. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, backwards. Oh, there I am. Okay. All right. So, the context. Or, as I like to say, getting from here, which is when I first arrived, and you can see we've got the super duper masks on, the respirator masks because some of the places we were working in had um, um, animals, bats, raccoons. So we had a whole other layer to deal with. So getting from here, which is getting to be a, a familiar picture, I don't feel nearly as bad showing this as I, as I did when I was putting it in the slide, which is great. 
to hear. So, and keep in mind, that's 13 years and a lot of work. Okay. So the scope of uh, Fanshawe Pioneer Village collection, this really has a lot to do with how our deaccessioning played out. So 50 years of collecting plus, we collect over a century of time. Right there, that's, that's massive. Uh, what do we collect? Everything from horse-drawn vehicles, agricultural implements, domestic objects, books, decorative arts. I was once asked um, by someone in the media, what do we collect? And I said, life, really. That's, that's what we collect. You think about it in any everyday life trade. That's what we collect from 1820 um, to 1920. The catch is, with our agricultural collection, we actually collect up to 1950, so there is even a, a little bit longer. Uh, smallest uh, thing I have in my collection is probably a little piece of type uh, to the biggest piece I have in my collection, which of course would be our buildings. So, my legacy. That's me trying to close the doors. Okay, so... Um, the legacy, or the um, Fanshawe Pioneer Village collection is based on a, a local collector, uh, Wilfred Jury. His very base seed collection was 2,000 pieces. And Fanshawe Pioneer Village actively collected, uh, and I mean actively, from 1959 until 2003. Um, really heavy, mostly in the 1980s, and from 2000 to 2003, just before I got there. Really depends a lot on your curator, um, on the extent of collection. Um, something else that was happening um, was the tiered and salvaged collect collection that is part of my site's history. And what do I mean by that? Because of the working agricultural um, nature of our site, because of our hands-on interactive component, we, we have in the past collected uh, both for the permanent collection and for the hands-on collection, which is quite normal. The difference is no distinction was made um, over the past 50 years. So everything was taken in an accession, regardless if it was meant to um, be a hands-on demonstration piece or an agricultural piece to work in the field. Salvage collecting. Uh, this I'll, I'll get to a little bit more in a moment, but um, there's always a worry on a site like ours that what if it breaks? So we better have at least 20 backup parts. <laughs> Even if we don't have that machine, it's good to have those backup parts. So um, no more room, not a problem. We'll bring in more heritage buildings and we'll fill them up. We brought a room again, no problem. When we bring in the next heritage building, we'll just put a basement in and we'll fill that up. And then when we're out of uh, room then, we'll bring in a storage portable and we'll fill that up. And so that's really what I arrived to in, in 2003. Um, this collecting had been going on without a collections mandate, without collections um, staff consistently there, without um, a collections management system or real database of any store, sort, and of course without any um, real adequate collection storage or resources in place. Um, we're still counting. We have, we have about two years left for our move, and when I say move, it's a bit... Um, uh, it's more than just a physical move. A move for us means uh, we're looking at everything from that object, from accessioning through to cleaning and proper storage. But uh, we are looking right now at about 45,000 pieces in our collection, plus we have over the past seven years deaccessioned 4,000 pieces. Okay. So I talked a little bit about salvage collecting. If you're looking at the screen, you've got a piece of a desk, um, painted a lovely shade of green, pulley, a bottom of a sewing machine, a seat to some agricultural um, machine, and a part of a, a bread making machine. Would you consider these artifacts in your collection? Just shout out. Who thinks these are artifacts? 
they are in mine as well. <laughs> because, as I said before, um, there wasn't a, um, a, a tiered system in terms of intent of use, but not in terms of the way things were managed. So half of these things might have accession numbers, the other half might not. There's really no clear way to tell, there is now of course, but not at this time, there's no way to tell what is permanent collection and what is not. So, um, in going back uh, to our planning for deaccessioning, I did consult with the um, CMA's Code of Ethics and also with staff there directly on this exact um, nature of these gray pieces. Um, in their Code of Eth Ethics, um, they um, give the advice that Disposals of non-registered non or non-accessioned objects are not uh, subject to the same requirements that material disposed of uh, that's accessioned is. So that the CMA even sees um, these in two different categories, accessioned versus non-accessioned. But after um, a lot of talking with colleagues and, and different um, uh, uh, organizer organizations and with our board and our staff Fanshawe Parnaby a village made a very important decision and we made the decision to treat all historic objects the definition for us was before 1960 as artifacts as accessioned artifacts even if they were not uh, even if they did not have an accession number um, why did we do this because of public trust because of ethics, not because it was the easy thing to do, but because it was, we thought, the right thing to do. Okay. Uh, so, um, what all changed from this, this collecting spree and um, um, active, collect, uh, active collecting? This would be our master development and business plan. And this new plan, um, specified very clear direction for our collections management program. A collection that meets the mandate of the Fanshawe Pioneer Village, a completely catalogued collection, an improvement of, existing, of artifact storage with an aim to exceed ministry standards for community museums. So these were my marching orders. The most important thing that uh, we were able to arrange, that I was able to um, gain board support for at this time, was a moratorium on collecting. For the first time in our history, we weren't actively collecting anymore. And this was a little bit of a surprise to the community, but it was all about how we dealt with it, and um, we, we always took the time to explain to people what we were doing and why we were having a pause in our collecting, because we were wanting to be better stewards of their collection. We wanted to make sure we were being responsible for the collection we had in, until we took anything more in. Uh, we did things uh, like try to get uh, donations to alternate institutions, um, put a wait list, which many people were happy to, to be on. A lot of this went on into a hands-on display collection, which was my holding tank for things that I might not necessarily want in the permanent collection, and by putting them in our hands-on collection, I had the option of moving, moving them to our educational collection or to our permanent collection. And I also had the discretion to accept pieces that I knew were very valuable, very pertinent, and rare examples. So how did we go about um, realizing these goals? Um, this was our, a storage project that um, has lasted from, lasted from 2004 to 2010. The first and most essential thing we did to get a full picture and a number of artifacts and the range of their type and scope, because there was no existing inventory ever, um, was we did a full inventory of five main storage areas, seven secondary storage areas, and that's a nice way of saying big barn, 
um, and three off-site storage areas, 15 storage areas. And we're, we're looking at, um, the largest storage area would probably be this side of, of the museum and the square. The smallest storage area would, would be about half of it. So we were talking about a lot of space to cover, hence the, the, the time period. At this point, we did take out non-artifact material and hazardous material. So rubbish, things that um, you know, were for site maintenance or old signage. So at this point, we did take out the obvious garbage, but we kept all the questionable parts and bits because we wanted to deal with all of the deaccessions as a whole. And because of the time period, and because I didn't have the new building funding in place or the building itself, we had this luxury to be able to, um, to pace ourselves. So then it was time for deaccessioning. And the most important thing that I had in my arsenal for that was a clearly written policy, very detailed policy and very detailed procedure. It covered all the scenarios. Um, and also standard forms. After we had those tools, we moved to um, the actual deaccessioning, which required both physical inspection and condition assessment, but also a review of the records and documentation, maybe some research on the provenance or rarity. Just because something was in very poor condition didn't mean it was gonna be deaccessioned if it had a high provenance. Every artifact or group of artifacts was evaluated by this criteria, hence the 10 years. So, deaccessioning. I always like to start with a definition, even though I'm sure we've all been involved with it before, just to bring us back to that, le to that level of, of meaning. So, the removal of an object or specimen from a museum collection. And it's important to remember with deaccessioning, we have both the deaccessioning, the, the, the removal of it from our records and from the collection um, as a system, but then there's also the physical disposal. So what actually happens to that physical artifact? You can de deaccession everything you want, past perfect, but if it's still in your, in your storage area, it's not really doing you much help. Um, and uh, just a quote from ICOM, uh, which really became my Bible for this whole project. Uh, the process of deaccessioning must only be undertaken with a full understanding of the significance of the item, its character, legal standing, and any loss of public trust that might result from such action. That last statement is why we are treating everything as it was accessioned. So, what was the process we followed at FPV? Um, strictly adhered to recognize museum standards and current professional, professional ethics. We ensured for every donation, we were legally free to act, we had clear title to the objects, or in those cases of the ones without accession numbers, that we had made a serious and diligent um, effort to, to go through documentation to try to pair up those mystery objects with, with a donation. Um, made sure that there was no restrictions associated with the material when it was originally acquired, and that the transaction is fully approved by the governing authority. So just to give you an idea, um, the checklist was what was required for every object or group of objects to, to go through. And that's one interesting thing I inherited was about 18 linear feet of new paper from all of the documentation that we generated from this. Um, but it was really important to, to document it to this, to this level, um, especially given the, the nature of um, the lack of documentation previously. Okay. So, um, deaccession artifacts um, are removed from the FPV permanent collection by the following methods, and this is in order of preference. 
We um, were very committed to keeping any material we deaccessioned in the public domain. So we started with us. If it could go to our hands-on educational collection, that's where it went. And at least um, 2,000 objects went to our hands-on collection. Offered as an exchange or gift, not sale. Again, that was our um, decision and our policy that we were not going to sell our objects to other museums. Um, we start with our local museums, move to um, regional and provincial. In the event that the artifact is not disposed of to the museum community, and I, I would try to find a home, um, then it may be the accession through public sale, which we did through anonymous public auction. All proceeds obtained through the sale of deaccession objects were directed back to acquisition and care, never to operations. FVV staff, board members, volunteers, and their families were not permitted to attend auctions or acquire deaccessioned items. And we clearly communicated this. Okay. So very briefly, because I know I'm writing on time. Um, what... Oh, final option, um, artifact will undergo intentional destruction. The good news is what I had left by this point was mostly uh, scrap metal. <laughs> so this, uh, um, by having a, a really good network and a really good um, um, method of communication to our other museums, who a lot of them were also expanding their educational collections, we were actually left with very little to dispose of. What we were left with was very large, heavy metal machinery. Okay. So, things that are deaccessioned. Uh, primarily from our collection. Artifacts that were beyond the scope of the FPV collections mandate. This was an industrial iron uh, of some sort. Um, one of the um, things in our collections man mandate uh, that we discussed and decided on was um, we weren't going to inter interpret electricity at our site. That had a cord beyond mandate. Um, objects that are duplicates. Yes, I know woodworking planes all have different functions, but I have two complete sets, so I didn't need the other 300. <laughs> um, objects of which we have other similar examples in extremely poor condition and not easily restored. It's, yeah, uh, <laughs> it just wasn't gonna. Um, this one was a favorite of mine. Um, Again, it was, uh, it was be before uh, 1960, so that's meant mixer, mixer was considered an artifact. Couldn't convince maintenance that they would ever use it on our site, so that became something that was deaccessioned. And finally, um, hazardous. My taxidermy did have leaky arsenic and a lot of critters living in it, so off that went. Old medicine, contaminated my, um, items, things that had mold, moth infestation. So here we are to the challenges, or I'm speeding along a little bit. Okay, so the challenges. Um, obviously I've talked about the bits and parts with no documentation that were mixed into the permanent collection. Um, that was a challenge, um, but only in terms of the time frame. Um, our decision to commit to treating everything as an accessioned object, I still believe was the right one. It just made things a lot more complex. Establishing legal ownership, this was quite interesting. Um, once we were um, ready to be off and running on this, we actually had to go back, um, the history of my organization is um, in 1990, it um, separated from the conservation area that founded it. And so while our organizations had separated, they hadn't actually transferred legal ownership to the collection to us. So um, I found out that I had to uh, we, we had to acquire legal ownership before we could do any deaccessioning. Time and people power. I'm the only person in the collections department at FPV. We have six um, full-time staff. We rely completely on seasonal staff and grants. So through YCW and MAP and OJCP and Ontario Trillium Foundation, this is how we got the job done and many wonderful volunteers. The hazmat. 
we have a large medical collection. We had a large funeral collection with embalming equipment. Um, I, uh, we needed to sort through these. Um, that required a whole other level of knowledge and a lot of conversations with CCI. And eventually, I got paired up with the, the biological specimens person because that was the closest match for what I was dealing with, with the embalming, was biological matter. Um, I didn't have a central holding tank, and on my site, things move around. So I'd gather up all my deaccessions in a corral, I'd come back on Monday, and they'd be gone. Um, <laughs> so I finally had to get a trailer um, and, and be able to put those in there and lock them down. Um, auctioneers, funny thing about this, for the point where we got to public auction, when I started in 2004, auctioneers abounded. When I finished this last go, we, um, we deaccessioned a small lot and that had to go to auction in 2014. Um, they're all going out of business. eBay is taking it over. I was so hard pressed to find somebody to take my items and put them to auction. And that is part of our deaccessioning procedure. That's what I had to do. Benefits. This is what really counts. Uh, I, we now have a collection that's uh, synchronized. Okay, yep, I'm off. Um, <laughs> um, we're ensuring the best use of future storage space and collections resources. So when it finally came time for us to move to Fanshawe Pioneer Village to our new, our new center, we weren't wasting our time moving things that didn't belong. Yes, it was hard to identify and remove hazardous materials. My poor husband, who's a chemist, spent one whole summer working with me. Um, but it was worth it. Um, you know how you tuck them away in a cupboard? I had a room of them. Um, growth of our hands-on collection. Donations to other local institutions that benefited. And one of the greatest things was communication with the two other museums in my community where we um, edge mandates. And as a collaborative, we, we discussed our collections practices. Who was collecting what? Um, we arranged transfers between our institutions. So archeological material went to the archeological museum. Pioneer material came to our museum. Demonst this is my lasting legacy to this organization. Um, demonstrating to the board um, the true cost of not having a collections management policy that is consistently adhered to and managed by professional staff. Even with the little bit that did go to public auction, this project cost thousands and thousands of dollars because there was no proper collecting procedures in place. And finally, accountability, a responsible steward of a significant collection of material culture. Tips and best practices, um, spend time reviewing and developing your policy and procedure. Ensure they are in full compliance with other institutional policies, professional practices, and federal regulations. Discuss the hard issues that might arise up front with your board. Conflict of interest. No, you can't buy any of this stuff. No, we are not selling things back to original donors when we've issued them a tax receipt. Um, set up a clear physical and document tracking system and standard forms. And my final note, communicate what you're doing clearly with your staff, volunteers, stakeholders, and public about deaccessioning. Be transparent and proactive in making sure they have the facts. Make sure your front line knows what you're doing. Give them the full scope that this is not selling off your collection. Um, people can get the wrong idea. This is about responsible public stewardship. This is about um, proper collections management. And by doing this, reorganizing your collection, relocating your collection um, can become a, a lot uh, easier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. This is uh, this is great. Very practical, um, and yeah, <laughs> as are all of the presentations today. Extremely practical. Um, would we? Are there any questions for for Shanna? Yes. Hi. Um, you so your medical stuff. 
because um, we have a collection from a doctor in our area and it's full of lots of lovely old medicines. Um, so did you get rid of them completely or did you just have them emptied and kept the bottles? Uh, no, we... Um we chose to keep the contents where they were stable. Um, that is part of its history. But where we had um, issues of leakage, that was the problem. So um, I developed a great relationship with um, our, our local hazardous um, women specialists, and they actually took that stuff off my hands, no, no cost. And that's amazing because it can be very costly. Um, the other thing is I have a very good relationship with our university, with the medical school, and with the Department of Anatomy, who autoclaved all of my um, metal um, instruments for embalming, because I, I didn't want the summer students to touch them <laughs> until I could be sure there was no hazards on those. So it's about, uh, about researching and, and relationships, and it was really um, uh, the medical profession that had said, you know, the value is what's in these bottles. Don't be getting rid of those. So it has to be stable, though, and, and sealed. Um, my name's Crystal from Museum Strathroy Caradoc. Um, I just had a question about the public's reaction to your deaccessioning. And I know um, sometimes they can have a negative uh, reaction to deaccessioning. Did you at all have that? No. And one of the reasons we were so proactive, we went as far as to put out a media release, um, host several community information sessions. One of the reasons we did that was our deaccessioning project came about a year after our museum had almost closed. So we really didn't want people to get the wrong idea. Um, we were lucky that the media came out and did, we had two media um, do, um, uh, articles on us and it was being able to convey that this is us being a good museum this is us taking care of your collection and once people understood the extent of you know what was being deaccessioned and why and that the really key London pieces were going to, to Museum London um, it it there wasn't a blip, so I was really happy. Our key stakeholders um, came to those, uh, the City of London, um, the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority, and um, were very, very much from the beginning quite settled with it because it was so well laid out. Um, and I gave a lot of people codes of ethics to read as well, so I think that, that um, soothed people. John Job, uh, Brent Museum and Archives. So um, when you uh, are offering ob the accession objects to other institutions, would you send them a completed list of all your deaccession? Or w how would you offer what to who? Good question. Um, we do them in batches. And back when I started, not everybody was even on email. So I used to have to fax and send letters by mail to people. So the process took a lot, uh, a lot longer. Um, now with the OMA listserv, <laughs> things are much speedier. Um, we do start, though, with our local um, sister museums. Um, and so we have a tiered system. I start with our local museums. Uh, and then we, um, I have a local um, listserv and then we move out to um, the province and it's by manageable batches so uh, usually no more than about 200 things of similar objects um, nope all different stuff okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when you were auction where did you have it uh, we um, dealt with um, three different auctioneers over the course of that decade, and those were held at the auctioneer sites. Um, we had a lovely local auctioneer that offered um, to do this free of charge for us, but it um, would have had to be on our site, and that was such an enormous conflict of interest that um, we didn't proceed with that. So um, I attended the, the, the auctions. They go so fast, and the kind of stuff that's getting to auctions, if you go to them, it's all box lot stuff. 
So it's, I couldn't even tell, you know, what was going, but I went for accountability and, um, you know, just to, to ensure that, you know, none of our volunteers unwittingly, you know, showed up. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Santa. Thank you. <laughs>